Hi, everybody. So I am here to do my lecture on neurosurgery part two. So I will go ahead and share my screen so you can follow along with me. But we will be talking about spine surgery today. So I actually left out a lot of details that I have learned personally um, about craniotomies because <laughs> it's just too many details and you guys are learning the basics. So uh, kind of the same thing with spine. I tried my best not to add in too many extra things. Like I could make an entire PowerPoint just on spinal cord tumors. They don't even address that in your book. So I want you to focus on the big picture so you guys will pass your CST and then I'll post another slide tomorrow just for some extra, uh, some of my neuroeducation so you can have that if you want it, but you know that that's not material that's gonna be on your exam so you don't spend all your time studying that stuff. But anyways, we are looking at neurosurgery. So. Follow along with me. I'm starting on page 1163. So go straight into spinal procedures after head procedures. And I wanna go over some things that we've talked about before. So you know that neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons both work on spine. So that can be kind of confusing because you'll see spine cases and it will specifically say ortho spines as only an orthopedic surgeon doing it. So I wanna point out what is in your book and you'll see this when you start externship. Neurosurgeons are almost always involved in cerv cervical procedures and both are going to intervene on lumbar procedures. So that means lumbar procedures, you will always have a ortho and a neurosurgeon. When it comes to cervical procedures, it says neurosurgeons are almost always involved. That just means some surgeons have more training on certain things. So if they have done hundreds of these cases and they know they can do it without a neurosurgeon, then they can do that. You just have to be trained in that and meet the qualifications to do that. But the way I have seen it and the way it is most places is a anterior cervical spine, which is typically an ACDF. You're gonna do that with a neurosurgeon and an orthopedic surgeon. As we know, as technology advances and as we get better with things, things change. So that's why you might see one or the other instead of both nowadays. But I have always seen it with both surgeons and definitely for lumbar procedures, both uh, surgeons. In fact, the two neurosurgeons that I started with, they tag teamed everything. And I shouldn't have said neurosurgeon because one was orthospine and the other one was strictly neurospine. So they were able to specialize in scoliosis cases. So they could do a long spine case and then work together. So the neurosurgeon was constantly working on the microscopic stuff, protecting the nerves constantly. And the orthopedic surgeon was taking out the pieces of bone and putting in the new hardware. So the orthopedic guy might be a little better at the hardware portion, whereas the neurosurgeon might be a little better at the delicate things. So everybody has their specialty and a lot of times they're going to have to work together. So you'll see that in spine a lot. Let's look at practical considerations. These are things that we talked about with the head procedure. So it's kind of repetitive. So I'm going to say it again because it's so important. Test your drills and saws before the procedure. Uh, you'll see a lot of these cases. You can take an iliac crest graft. Or you could use a graft, you know, from a cadaver out of a freezer. But if you are setting up, you're so worried about all the neuro stuff, you might set up your little drill for the iliac crest and then not test it. So any powered equipment, make sure you're thinking safety first and testing those things. Uh, after that, cut surgicel, which is another word for newnet, surgicel, and then gel foam. So all these things are going to help stop the bleeding during the case. And then remember gel foam, they soak in thrombin to help even more uh, stop the bleeding and let us keep on going with the procedure so we can actually visualize and see. Because so that's the whole point of all these hemostatic agents, right? We just can't see. It's not, oh, it's bleeding so much, it's in danger for the patient. Everything just oozes constantly. So you need lots of hemostatic agents so they can see. And I think once you do a spine case for the first time, you will understand that because of where we're making the incision, it's just oozing from both sides back into what we're trying to look at, at the spine. 
So it's almost annoying. You're constantly suctioning and just, they just want to see so badly so they can do their job. So that's your job to provide them lots of hemostatic agents um, and sponges during the case. So that brings me to the next one, sponges. Keep close track of all small countables. So I didn't talk about this yesterday because I wanted to talk about it today. When you have lots of cottonoids, because you're going to use those on both uh, cranies and spine procedures, there's lots of different ways to keep track of them. There were some craniotomies where I always had 30 cottonoids, and they were micro cottonoids. Uh, let's see if I have anything small enough. <laughs> it's about the tip of an eraser. Very small micro cottonoids with a very thin string attached to it. So the way I kept track of extremely small sponges like that, I always had a stapler on my back table with a towel and I would staple the sponges when the surgeon was done using them to this towel. Because these aren't the types of sponges that you want to throw into a kick bucket. It is not. You want to keep all of this stuff on your field. Um, it's hard enough for your circulator to run around the room, get us everything we need as we need it, as it comes up, and hang up all the laps and ratex from the case. You don't want to give them cottonoids on top of that. Not to mention, I don't want to pass those off the field. They're so tiny, I'm keeping that responsibility. That's okay. So I wanted to point that out to you because you have had drilled into your head. We always put bloody sponges in the kick bucket. That is accurate, but I suggest to you with cottonoids to not do that. Keep it on the field in some way. Um, that brings me to another one. I have seen a scrub tech uh, take one of their basins and just always throw their cottonoids into that basin. So then when it came time to count, they could pick them all out one at a time and count them. See, mine was a little easier because I stapled it to the towel so you could see all the squares. So I picked up my towel to my circulator and counted one, two, three, four, five, all the way down. So lots of different ways to deal with all of these supplies, but in general, you're gonna have Lots of hemostatic agents, lots of cool instruments, and lots of small sponges. So lots of things to keep track of, but that's why I like it. Okay, so I go straight into a big anatomy review for you. So these are pictures, so you can do your review on your own. So make sure you are reading everything on page 1163 about your uh, vertebral column anatomy. So it's all on here for you. I'm gonna skip that one, you should know how many vertebrae we have, um, how many is in each section. So this is all review, uh, like all of this that I typed out, seven cervical vertebrae, that should be memorized for you already. So I'll tell you the same thing I did with the cranial nerves. I'm telling you, you should have already have this memorized. If for some crazy reason you don't, this is your chance. Questions like these will absolutely be on the CST, and it actually could just be part of a question. So they could start with, you know, C7. They're talking about a case and they say C7. And you don't know what that means. You don't know that means cervical vertebrae number seven, the last cervical vertebrae. So you're not even understanding the question if you don't understand the anatomy. So make sure you understand all of that page and you study it all. Now the reason I put these pictures on here is so you can really see the difference between all of the vertebrae. Seeing this lateral view makes a huge difference. So. I will go through a couple of these pictures with you. So we'll start with cervical vertebrae. Uh, of course, there's seven, and you need to remember that your atlas goes before your axis. I saw a little bit of that with anatomy. We would get them mixed up. So I will tell you the easiest way for me to remember it was you need your atlas to travel around the axis. So you need your atlas to see where you're going. <laughs> so kind of a silly thing, but that's an easy way for me to remember it but your cervical vertebrae can be worked on posteriorly and anteriorly. So that's a little bit different. You're not going to see that with different portions of the spine. Like for instance, lumbar, we only do posterior. So I'll go through some of those things as we read. But you can see your cervical vertebrae have a specific look and C1 and C2 are specific too. So C1 and C2 are like separate vertebrae, the rest of them are gonna look just like this right here. Okay, so after cervical, I go to thoracic vertebrae. Thoracic was my favorite kind of spine cases, and this big spinous process is why. So as you're doing the case, one of the first things they wanna remove is that spinous process. 
to decompress the spinal cord. So after they remove that spinous process, you like, ooh, that's a lot of bone, I want that. I wanna save that, that's a good one. This is something that could be used later for your bone mill. So this is what I brought up yesterday in your equipment. So you have a bone mill, so you could take a big piece like that, make sure you get a periosteal elevator, get all the periosteum off of it, get a ronger, get all the soft tissue and um, connective tissue off of it, then put it in your bone mill, mill it up. You can use it at the end of the procedure with an implant. So lots of different options. Uh, when it comes to stuff like that, you always ask questions. So if you didn't see bone mill as have available on your cart, and you know that that's not something that your facility uses, that means as soon as you get that big piece of bone out, while you're scrubbing, you need to be breaking that bone into little pieces with your rongers. So that's another reason I liked spine because they were constantly asking for instruments, but even in between that, I was busy because the second I handed over an instrument, I had a ronger in my hand and I was cleaning up the bone. I liked it. I think it was fun to, I felt like I was more a part of it. I cleaned up that bone and I chopped it up and prepared the graft. And so I wasn't just handing them instruments. I was more a part of what was going on. So there's your thoracic vertebrae. Don't forget that that articulates with 12 ribs. After that, you see lumbar vertebrae. Uh, lumbar vertebrae is gonna be worked on a lot, and that's the first case that is talked about in your book, lumbar laminectomy. So don't forget this is five bones, and you need to know it's two main responsibilities. So it provides support and flexibility. And when it says large, heavy bodies, that means this, the body, the vertebral body is larger and heavier, because it's providing a lot of support for your body and also that flexibility. So it must have a larger body. So still a big spinous process to take off, but lots of bone mill happening on these cases also. After that, I talk about the sacrum and the coccyx. So this just all goes in order in your book. So you should remember that it's five fused bones and four fused bones. So don't forget as you're looking in the center, these are vertebrae. So S1 to S5 are vertebrae that are fused. You will see cases that are the last lumbar vertebrae fused to the sacrum. So, and sometimes you will be working on the sacrum that's still considered spine, all the way to the coccyx is considered spine. So just keep that in mind. Okay, after that, I get into the spinal cord anatomy. So page 1,165, you really need to look at 1,164 also. You should really be familiar with both of these pictures. So I won't go through how many nerves and all that. You can read and review. You should know that part. So after that, let's look at all the nerve roots and where they're all coming from. So basically, this is the danger with spine surgery. We are taking all that protective bone off, all the spinous process and the lamina, and we're exposing the spinal cord. So as we do that, there are these little nerve rootlets. So you see this connection right here and right here. It's kind of like it's grabbing on to the spinal cord. So right there is where the surgeon has to be really careful to not tear that root. So if they damage the root, they can attempt to repair it, but they usually can't. So we are hurting our patient if we are damaging that root. So that means we're causing nerve damage to our patient. So because of this, make sure you look at this anatomy and fully understand it. So look at what's in your book, but I also really want you to look at this picture. And I want you to see where the spinal cord is and how the spinal nerves come out from that. And you can see where it attaches anteriorly the root and posteriorly the root. So make sure you go over that part so you understand that anatomy. And then over here, I added a picture just so you can see another picture of what's in your book. So let me go over that a little bit. Let's talk about the neural arch. So find that part at the top of the right page. As the neural arch extends from the body of the vertebrae on each side of the vertebrae, it is referred to as the pedicle. So as you're reading, you'll hear the term the pedicle a lot and we'll be putting pedicle screws in. So you need to understand where the pedicle is. The lateral extensions of the pedicles are called the transverse processes. 
So you should already know your processes. It's just describing it further for you. It's giving you more anatomy there. Okay, and then after that, it gets into more anatomy. So I'm going to skip over. So lumbar laminectomy, even though that's been the last few pages, it's all been anatomy review. So now you actually see what they're doing on a lumbar laminectomy. So they are removing that lamina so we can expose the spinal cord. So know where your lamina is. Know, <clears throat> excuse me, know that the lamina extends from each side of the vertebrae and it connects to form that spinous process. So that's the big part that's sticking out that we are removing that spinous process. And I want you to also look at the disc. So you can see the disc right here. I told you I liked taking disc out because it looked very similar to crab meat to me. So it looked like white and pinkish pieces of crab meat. Uh, I want you to know that they can keep this and use it for specimen. So let's look at your anatomy in here. So it starts at intervertebral discs. That's the bullet point I'm at. So the disc itself is compromised of fibrous connective tissue. You need to know that. Fibrous connective tissue. You need to know the tough outer layer. That's the annulus fibrosus. And then that core, more importantly. I think I should go back to this picture for that. There we go. This picture. So the core is right here, the nucleus. So you need to know both of these layers. And you need to see the relation with the spinal nerve. So if you know both of those with your anatomy, then you should be able to keep reading onto the pathology. So that's really the parts I want you to focus on. So there are some extra things on this slide and it's to help you understand, but I want you to know the terms that are in your book. Okay, so after that, it goes into some of the pathology for a lumbar laminectomy. So you'll see some of the different reasons for it. I put some of the pictures right here. So you can see what a normal disc should look like, the degenerative disease, what it looks like if it's bulging out, if it's herniated completely out the back, if it's thinning due to age, if it's disc degeneration or even osteophyte formation. And remember those osteophytes are those bone spurs and that could be causing pain for our patients. So those are just some of the reasons why we're gonna come in and do a lumbar laminectomy. You should look at everything on page 1066 to 1067 for all of that pathology you should know. After that, I got some more pictures so you can actually understand what it's gonna look like when they're done. So all of these are indications for surgery. I went over some of those, but it's a different picture so you can kind of understand. So I was just talking about bone spurs, osteophytes, you can see that right here. It's causing spinal cord compression. This is causing pain for our patient, compressing their spinal cord. You can see that a ruptured disc can do the same thing for a spinal nerve. So because that nerve rootlet is right there, it's going to put pressure on that and cause compression. So many different reasons to get that lumbar laminectomy, but you can see some of that visual here now. All right, so before I get into this picture, lumbar laminectomy, look at the bottom of 1,167. I just wanna remind you the imaging for this case that needs to be done. So CT or MRI scanning and a myelogram are useful in identifying the lumbar disc herniation. You need to know this because you always need to know the tests that are done so that they can diagnose this because we're not just assuming, we're not just, we have to have images to go off of and to help us plan this surgery. Most of the time you're gonna see that imaging in the room um, beforehand. Okay, so I've got two videos of lumbar laminectomy on here for you. What your book is talking about is a regular lumbar laminectomy. I also put minimally invasive on here so you know that that is an option. So I'll talk a little more about that, but I want you to know all the options. So actually, before I flip over on that same page, I wanna point out equipment, instruments, and supplies. So yes, a laminectomy set, if your facility has one, sometimes it's just spine tray. Um, those are the regular instruments, I wanna point that out. So those are your regular instrument tray. On top of that, 
you're going to have a sales rep that's going to bring in your implantable items. This is where it's like orthopedics. You will receive trays and trays and trays of implantable items. They also have special retractors like you can see in the back here on the back table that are specific for that type of surgery. So this is not something that you're used to in the lab, having one nice little tray. You're gonna have two back tables, one with your regular instrumentation, one with all your implantable items, and sometimes you'll have another table if there's not enough room. I always had another uh, prep stand draped out for my bone mill. So that wouldn't take up room on my table, and you'll very often have two mayo stands for these. So very involved cases, but that's why you are friendly with your sales rep because they will save you in the case, especially if they have a little laser pointer. They say, I'll pick up that and then that and then that, and they can tell you exactly what it is in order. So they're there to help you. Okay, so after you watch those videos, you should understand a little bit more of what's happening because it's hard to explain all of this case uh, over our lecture. So looking back one more time, equipment, instruments, and supplies. So I wanna also uh, point out that you'll need hemovac drains for these cases. There's lots of bleeding that happens and we need to have a really good drain with lots of suction to make sure that the blood isn't pooling on these patients' backs because a lot of times they are flipped over so they're prone and so we're immediately flipping them back onto their incision. That's not like surgery very often, right? If you have surgery on your belly, you lay on your back, you let your belly rest. You don't have that option when you have posterior back surgery. So just keep that in mind. Uh, last thing, there is a Taylor retractor, which you should be familiar with. And sometimes they're going to use Krillex with that Taylor retractor. So that is one small thing that you need to really pay attention to on this case. Now you can flip it over and this is all review so I did not add pictures because we've already talked about equipments and supplies. So you're gonna need the Wilson frame and everything needs to be padded very well. I've talked about this, so I'll only say it, but one more time. When we learned how to position for prone, we learned how to check the body, males and females, to make sure nothing is being impinged. So think about it, we are flipping over into prone for what is potentially hours and hours. So on males, you need to check the penis and the testicles to make sure nothing is being pinched. And on your female patients, you need to check the breast tissue and make sure it is basically, they wanna put the chest rolls on the side near the shoulders so that the breast tissue can hang freer. But everybody's different sizes, so you need to anticipate what you're gonna need for this patient. So what I'm saying is some patients are gonna need more padding um, and more positioning equipment than others. So. Wilson frame for sure, but make sure you check the boys and the girls and make sure nothing is being pinched during the case, very important. Okay, I'm gonna go through this case um, and you should go through it again directly after with the pictures that are in your book. So I will go off of page 1,168. So these are big cases, we're gonna start with a 10 blade. So you start with a 10 blade, once you get in and all the muscles are separated, you're gonna use a periosteal elevator and an osteotome. I said and or, periosteal elevator or an osteotome. Now you can see on this Mayo stand, they are ready to go with their cob elevators. That's one of the first things you're gonna use. So they have them on the Mayo stand, ready to go. After that, you're going to place a self-retaining retractor. So it gives you lots of different options. You should be familiar with all of those retractors. So if you don't see it in here, you need to look it up in your orange book or look it up somewhere else because there's so many neuro instruments, you're not going to see them all pictured here. And if I listed them all, this would be a 50 page slideshow. So you need to look at those retractors and be familiar with all of them. You should definitely know the Atzen Beckman. That's one that we use a lot on lumbar laminectomies. So Cobb elevator to get off that periosteum, retract a little bit, and then um, provide your self-retaining retractor. So after that, look at number four on that page. Spinous process is removed and rongeurs are used to remove the margin of the lamina. So we're removing spinous process and lamina. Let's break it down into simple steps. We're removing that big spinous process and some lamina so we can expose the spine. 
all of this time before the spine is exposed, we're still careful. We don't pass over the spinal cord or anything like that. But once the spinal cord is exposed, you should be even more vigilant because when you're passing things, you cannot let anything fall onto that patient. You could paralyze a patient if you drop something on the spinal cord. So you're gonna be very careful. And I'll talk about that a little more before the end of the slide, or before the end of my lecture here. So after that, go to number five on the next page, 1,169. So after that, we're gonna use a kerosene ronger to get out the rest of that lamina and uh, spinous process. After that, the dura and the nerve root are carefully retracted medially with a nerve root retractor. So you should know your nerve root retractor. It's in your orange book, especially the love nerve root retractor. Uh, if you get to hold this one, especially for the first time, I'll go ahead and tell you to just hold your breath because you are retracting the spinal cord. You're, if you're ever retracting a nerve, you need to be completely still. So this made me very nervous the first time and I felt like I actually held my breath the whole time, which I'm sure is impossible, but that's how still I was. So I want you to take it seriously if somebody gives you that opportunity to hold this retractor. Um, most of the surgeons I worked with, they would make sure you were good at your job first. You had to prove yourself and then you're able to hold that retractor. But really, they're supposed to trust you. you if you're in that room, then you should know what you're doing. So if you're holding a love nerve root retractor, you should know to never move it and be unbelievably still like a statue. So anyways, now hold the nerve root retractor. And after that, you should look at your procedural consideration. So anytime there are bone fragments, you should have a Raytec unfolded in your hand ready to grab bone. Now I say Raytec, there are some scrub techs who like to use lap sponges. So it is scrub tech preference but this is how this is gonna go. They're gonna fight with the kerosene. They're not gonna look away from the field and they're gonna hold it out to you. Your kerosene has that little pistol grip, right? So they took a piece of bone and they're just holding it out to you and they're waiting to feel you get your Raytex sponge and grab the bone out of that kerosene. And they expect you to do it very quickly. It should take a second and then go right back to working. So really they are looking down at the spine Take a bite of bone, hand. Take a bite of bone, hand. You should be expected to be right there with the sponge grabbing that bone off the kerosene. And it does not come off easily either. It's not just a little wipe. It's a you have to get in there. It's a piece of bone stuck into a piece of metal. There are many times that I poked a hole in my glove doing exactly this move. So you don't have a choice on spine. You do need a double glove. It's not an option like other procedures where you get that option a single glove, you will double glove, and you should have another pair of gloves open on your field because that could very easily put a hole in your glove. Because of that, you need to be vigilant. Looking at your hands, make sure there's not a hole in your glove from that very sharp bone. So always have your lap sponge or Raytac ready to grab pieces of bone out of that kerosene ronger. So after that, it goes into the next one, pituitary ronger. So you should know now, because I told you yesterday that pituitary rongers are used to take out disc. This is that disc material, it's softer, that's why we're gonna use these right here, pituitary rongers. So again, kerosene rongers, see they're sharp on the end, they're gonna take pieces of bone, pituitary rongers for disc. So after that, they can use a Curette. Curettes can be used in the interventebral disc space to remove any fragments or disc material. So that's why you have lots of curettes up on your Mayo too. After that, the fusion can be performed. So it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail on your fusion, but I will show you guys some pictures and you should definitely watch the video to fully understand it. Um, I'll explain the fusion part in just a moment. So I'm just gonna say they're gonna perform the fusion. So that's inserting the screws and then the bars so that the uh, spine is fused now. So they'll perform the fusion is number eight. And then number nine, that bone graft material is placed in the intervertebral disc. So it says iliac crest a lot in your book. I think that that is more rare now. We like to use cadaver bone from the freezer so we don't have to make another incision on our patient. But Usually that is approach to the patient as an option. So they can decide whether they want cadaver bone or their own iliac crest bone. 
Okay, now we can flip it over. So here's all your beautiful pictures explaining this procedure step by step, even from the positioning. So I'm looking at your positioning on 1171. So you can see the details of the Wilson frame and fully understand it. After that, if you flip it over to 1172, they're gonna go through the case step by step as I just did, but with pictures. So you should redo what I just did with you, go step by step through these pictures. So now for the fusion, let's stop at page 1175. So here you can see what the fusion looks like. They skipped a lot of steps here, so let me fill you in. They are gonna start after all the exposure, all the bone, the disc has been removed, and we placed that bone graft. Now we can do the fusion of the vertebrae with screws, it says, and plates, but as you can tell, it can be a bar. So this is much more common. So we're gonna put the screws in. The tops of the screws have this little indention for a bar to lay over. So it's actually a little bit different than orthopedics. We're gonna do screw first. So we put the screw in first. After we get all of the screws in, we can look at that little divot at the top of all the screws and line it up so we can put the bar right there. So the bars are gonna go on top of those screws. So that the bar is secure, we're gonna add what's called a set screw on top of that. So you can't see that in this picture of the book, but that little circle that's on top of the bar is a set screw. So these are actually three separate pieces. So we have the screw that's in the spine, we have the bars that are laying over the divots and the screws, and then you have a set screw on top of that to secure it. So three different things. So make sure you add that in, and if any of that is confusing to you, watch out some of the many videos that are on my YouTube channel, and then I posted two to go with this one. So you definitely have to watch it to understand it. Okay, so after lumbar laminectomy, I'll show you this beautiful Mayo setup. So I put it second for a reason, <laughs> still lumbar laminectomy, but you see they have two mayos, and really the only thing that should be up there that's not are some sponges. It's beautiful. So they have all different kinds of curettes set up. I am pointing this out so you understand. This isn't we're using one kerosin rongeur. You have a set of kerosin rongeurs, and they're going to be very specific. I want, they're usually number one through five. So let's say I want a number five kerosin. Um, 45 degree angle or 90 degree angle. They can be very specific. So you need to really look at your instrument as you're setting up. Because as you're a student, the preceptor might say, throw all the kerosens up there. You should be able to do that. You know what a kerosen rondure is. Later on, as they scrub in with you, they might tell you, this surgeon likes to start with a two kerosen rondure. That's something specific for the surgeon you wouldn't have known and that's why the preceptor is there. But this basic stuff, you should know. You should know your pen fields. You should know that this is a Whitson. You should know that these are elevators. You should know we use bipolar. You know that this is your pneumatic drill. You should be familiar with all these kerosens and these Adson and Lexel rongeurs, these pituitary rongeurs, cerebellar retractors, and these all curettes. So again, you should be familiar with these instruments. Make sure you're studying them. Uh, this video, so I will warn you about this video. Not everybody has blue wraps, right? So they actually have cloth wraps on everything. So you'll see them opening all of these trays and their cloth wraps. So all of our blue wraps, we throw away, unfortunately, or find another use for them in the hospital. But those cloth wraps are reused constantly and re-sterilized. So I thought that was interesting, but that's also a small case. So I hope as you're watching that video, you can see, yes, it's really going through the scrub tech role of the spine surgery more than the actual case, which is why I added it. But there's a lot of moving parts going on that you need to kind of hone in on one thing at a time. So I put other videos for you to understand the surgery. This one is for you to understand what all you're gonna have to do as a scrub tech. There's just a lot of trays that you're gonna have to grab and then a lot of steps that you're not gonna be taught on. You don't learn that in school, just like orthopedics. You learn it at the moment you're doing it. You learn it as you're doing it with the rep. 
Um, and after that, you know the rules, it's watch one, uh, do one, teach one. So you should be ready to explain it to somebody else. So again, my urge to you is after you do a case like this as a student, go in that break room and sit down and write down everything that you can remember. And then when you get home, watch some YouTube videos so you can learn more and be better the next time. That's how we get better at these cases. Okay, sorry. We're not going to go to ACDF yet. Look at micro decompression of endoscopic spinal discectomy. So I didn't put a setup for this one for a reason. It is endoscopic. So you should know what the setup's gonna look like. You're gonna have an endoscope, a camera, and a light cord, uh, but the rest of it is going to be similar procedure. So I wanna point out the things that are the same. So, we're still doing a discectomy, so we're taking out the disc, but you can see that there's not a lot of other things that are happening like with the open procedure. So we're not gonna be removing bone or fusing bone. Now we're still gonna have the same preoperative diagnostic tests. So CT scan, MRI, myelogram are all gonna reveal disc herniations and disc issues. Um, now I will point out what is different. So positioning. It says most frequently lateral. So because the incision is so small, it's more lateral than posterior. So it's almost posterior, posterior to lateral is what it looked like to me, but they are saying lateral in your book. So that's different than our prone procedures to make sure you know that positioning. One more thing you need to pay attention to. So why would somebody choose to do a endoscopic versus an open? Well, it's minimally invasive, so we're cutting through less muscles, but there are specific cases that they're going to be able to do it endoscopically. So if it's more involved and they need to actually look at the bone, this isn't gonna be an option for them. They're gonna to have to do an open procedure, but some patients are able to do this endoscopically. So let's see another reason why they pick this. So at the bottom of 1,176, 40% less than an open lumbar laminectomy. So that is why a lot of patients choose this procedure if they have that option. They want a less expensive procedure because surgery is very expensive. Now it still has a very high success rate. 90% of patients experience permanent pain relief. So um, very interesting. The spine surgeons I worked with uh, did everything open. So they weren't big fans of the commercials that they saw that said one inch incision for your spine surgery. And they would kind of laugh at that because like I said, these are patients that don't have as much involvement. So a patient that has really degenerative disc disease, we may not be able to do it endoscopically. So when you see commercials like that, yeah, it sounds fantastic, but there's only certain patients that are really gonna receive that benefit from those types of cases. Other more involved cases, we're gonna have to be open. So. Just pay attention to those little things, and there's no slide for that one because it's endoscopic. Now I can go to ACDF. So ACDF, as you know, very common to have a neurosurgeon and a orthopedic surgeon working together on this one. It's a lot of imaging happening, and I wanted to show a labeled one for you. So when you see the surgeons looking at the imaging, maybe you can understand what they're looking at. So when I first looked at the spine, I didn't really, I was looking at all the vertebrae, so I wasn't really seeing where the bulging was happening on the spinal cord. So you can see really well right here how when that disc bulges out, it's gonna push on the spinal cord and really cause pain for your patient. So I want you to understand the exposure step-by-step -step and the procedure. So you need to watch these videos in order. So you'll see the exposure and then the actual surgery. So let's look at a couple things in your book. So this anterior approach, which is anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, is useful for treatment of spinal stenosis at the cervical and thoracic levels. So you can go ahead and flip it over after that. You'll see a good picture of a lateral cervical x-ray, but this one is labeled for you. So lots of different reasons to do this one, not just that one reason. So make sure you're reading through that entire page and understanding it because I want to focus more on the cool instrumentation. So let's start with equipment, instruments, and supplies. Cloward instruments, you need to be familiar with that. Cloward instruments. 
and I will show you some of those handheld and self-retaining retractors. So this is an example of it's kind of two options. There are handheld, you see the handles right here, and self-retaining options. So this is called a rainbow retractor. I put that for a reason. There's a few different brands. The Phantom is just one of the brands. So the one I used was called Shadow Line. Um, it didn't have quite as many pieces in the picture, so that's the only reason it's not pictured. There's many different kinds, but all of them are gonna be called a rainbow retractor. So you should lump in your mind a CDF with rainbow retractor every time. So rainbow retractor, and then you see your little implant we're gonna put in the neck right here also, and what your plate and screws are gonna look like. Uh, after that, so clowered instruments, you know, rainbow retractor, you have now added on here. So vertebral spreader, you'll definitely need. Cervical drill with guards. So you guys have seen a spinal drill, so I didn't add that in here. It's just got a longer handle on it so we can get deep into the spine. So yes, we'll be drilling some bones, so you need to be irrigating and suctioning if able to do that or allowed to do that. After that, uh, it's talking about things to get a bone graft. So if you're using a cadaver bone graft, you may not need all of these things. So this is what you should have available. Bone graft holder, impactor, bone curettes, and rongers. So I want to point out something. They, you could do the iliac crest graft, but even if you use the cadaver, you'll still need that bone graft holder. So I don't believe it is pictured here, but it's just a handheld instrument that has two little prongs on the side. So you can put the bone graft in and it holds onto it really nicely so the surgeon can insert it safely. And after that, they use a mallet to mallet it into place. So it fits extremely snugly. After that, look at your pre-op preparation and your prep. So this is prepping the neck and the iliac crest. So reminder, iliac crest graft is an option. So here's your beautiful rainbow retractor. Uh, let me explain this a little bit. So everybody see this rainbow stick. So this rainbow stick, after all the exposure is done, some of this retraction is put in, we're gonna use that rainbow stick to measure the size blade of retractor that we need. So it's measuring the depth inside the neck and then they can pick a retractor blade. So a lot of times they would measure and say purple. So Michelle, I need a purple. Now I was supposed to with the surgeons I knew know what kind of purple blade they needed. So there's lots of different ways to describe it. So some of these have two teeth on the end, some have three, some have a lot of jagged edges on the end. So the one that my surgeon used a lot was, he would say black Bart Simpson again. <laughs> so the top of it would look like Bart Simpson's hair, the little triangles all over the top. So I knew if he said black Bart Simpson, I knew exactly Exactly which retractor he wanted, so I would grab the black blade that has those edges on the end, attach it to this handle right here, and then pass it over. So then that is their handheld retractor, and then they can switch it to this self-retaining retractor after that. So that's why you see your rainbow retractor to start with in the beginning. So this is what it's talking about. It says clowered retractors. Okay, after that, you see this mayo setup. So again, you'll think this mayo setup is messy and it is not, it is very organized. So ACDF, this is your mayo setup. So first of all, see how many extra Fraser suctions this person has? So and that means they are ready. The second the surgeon says the suction is clogged, they're not gonna take the time to clean it out. They're gonna pop on a new one and hand it right over to the surgeon. While they're working, I'm gonna clean out that suction with the Spilat. Oh man, everything else is up here ready to go. So I kinda wanna go over some of these instruments before I get going. So you can see the local anesthetic right there and your retractor over here, a little wheat liner, self-retaining. But you see the rainbow stick, right? So they might put that wheat liner in and then do the rainbow sizing and then switch to that retractor. So you can see that this scrub tech doesn't have everything to go with this rainbow retractor, all these pieces up on the mayo. They have that on the back table organized, ready to go. It's one quick grab. They don't have room for that on their mayo stand. So they just have the rainbow measuring device 
to start with. So they might say measuring stick, measuring device, something like that. You can see they have care center onders for bone. They have curettes for bone. And then they have pituitary rongers for disc. Now they've got scissors and other instruments to dissect with, but you should recognize this Penfield 4 right here. And there should be bone wax on the end of that to hand the surgeon. And yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a Woodson elevator right next to it. And you should be familiar with that one too. Now what you're not gonna be familiar with is this black handle right here. So this is what I was talking about that you can put the graft onto and hand to the surgeon so they can insert it into the spine. So this scrub tech, even with their cottonoids, is ready to go. So you can't see all the cords, so I'll point out two sections ready to go. So they have a whole nother suction tubing, probably another machine in the room to avoid the suction getting clogged. Um, they have a magnetic holder to lay on top of the patient. So if they set small delicate instruments like this wood center tracker, the Penfield 4, on there, it's not gonna roll onto the floor. It'll stay up on the field. Uh, underneath here, so you can see it's the little bovie holder, right? So I can guarantee you that it's got your bovie with the cord in it and the bipolar cord. So you will need bipolar and the bipolar force up is right here. Okay, I think I went through everything on that Mayo stand, but check out what your implants are gonna look like because these are just instruments, right? That's not the plate and the screw that's gonna go in the neck. You need to be familiar with that stuff. So this is just one brand. This is Stryker's brand of their cervical fixation, but you can click on that link and see what all they offer for cervical fixation. Let's see if I have another picture, I can't remember. Okay, so ACDF, I will go through this procedure. So let's look at, so incision with a 10 blade, and then let's look at the anatomy. Number two, the esophagus, carotid artery, and trachea are all retracted medially. You need to know that. All of that is retracted. Um, the periosteum of the cervical vertebrae bodies are stripped away with a periosteal elevator. And the next thing you're gonna need is a spinal needle. I'm looking for the spinal needle on the Mayo stand. They might have it in the sharp zone. It might be under some things over here that I can't see, but you always need a spinal needle for ACDFs. Now, some people have you bend the spinal needle in a certain direction, which is kind of weird for a script tech to bend a needle on purpose, but it helps them with imaging. So I will get to that next. A spinal needle is inserted into the vertebral space. Then they're gonna come in with x-ray and it's gonna be taken to identify the proper level. So even though we have imaging pictures all up in the room, we're gonna take a live picture with a needle in the vertebrae to confirm, yes, this is where we are. Because you do not wanna miscount as you're going down the vertebrae and do this procedure on the wrong vertebrae or wrong disc. So x-ray is taken to verify. After that, you can do your iliac crest or get your bone graft. So then blades are chosen for the cloward self-retaining uh, retractor. So this is where I was telling you they are going to use the stick, the rainbow stick, to find their color. And then they will tell you what color retractor they need and what they want the blade to look like. And then you will be putting that together before handing it over to the surgeon. Um, after you have your cloward retractor in, you're going to make another incision. So this should be a new blade, not the tin blade you used for skin. Another deep blade. So an incision is made into the disc space with a 15 blade on a long knife handle, so number seven, and then the disc material is removed with a pituitary ronger. So you already knew that, and you should be ready with your Raytex sponge to grab those pieces. Now what I want you to add, well actually it says it for you, I was going to have you add it the disc material that's removed with that pituitary ronger can be sent for specimen. So it says, it says is sent for specimen. Same thing, you need to communicate with your surgeon just as we taught you. So you need to ask them, do you want this to be sent for specimen? Because even though your book says that, and I want you to know these facts, not all surgeons actually follow that. They don't actually send it off to pathology. So make sure you're asking questions and you're knowing what the surgeon wants. Okay, so after that, what is not pictured on here? A caliper. So procedural consideration. They can put in a vertebral spreader 
into that disc space, but they could also use a caliper to ensure the vertebrae are distracted um, to the proper placement. So these are called distraction pins. They will give you little pins that looks like a screw, give you a little handle that looks like a screwdriver, you pop the pin in, they put the pins in for distraction. So you just need to keep track of them. They usually come in pairs, so you'll have two or four of them, usually two, and that'll be a countable item you should keep track of. So know that is used for distraction. Make sure you know that word, used for distraction. After that, after your procedural consideration, they're gonna measure the depth of that space, and then the cervical drill guard is inserted into the space. So the hole is drilled with a clower drill on the Hudson brace and the drill and guide are removed. So there's different options for this. So it says Hudson brace and drill guide are removed, but you can see the tip of the drill right here that they're going to be using. So this is a Midas Rex electric drill. This is what's more likely going to be used. So. I want you to know what it says in your book on number eight, but I'm giving you the more practical consideration. This is what we are using now, electric drills. Okay, after that, look at your procedural consideration. So for the bone graft, an impactor and a mallet are typically necessary to properly place the bone graft within the disc space. So this is whether it is a cadaver bone or the iliac crest bone. We wanna mallet it into place so it's seated in with the bone. So there's no space in between, they are right next to each other, no room for error. Okay, so after that, it's your fixation, and then you're gonna remove the retractors, irrigate out the wound, and close it up. So that's your ACDF. Make sure you watch the video so you fully understand that procedure. Okay, that brings me to posterior cervical decompression. So yes, we can work on the cervical spine posteriorly. The positioning is what is totally different on this, so I'm not gonna go through the procedure. What you need to know that's different is the positioning. So here is a position of the head and pins and the Mayfield skull clamp uh, for spine. So it's for posterior cervical spine. I want you to look at all the egg crates. That's what these are called, egg crate padding, the foam. You can see why it's called egg crates. That's what it looks like. All the tape, how they're taped to the bed. And then on top of that, this is the main thing I want to talk about, all of these lines. Do you see all of these crazy lines? We're about to drape over that. So in the very beginning of your book, not the beginning of your book, at the very beginning of spine, I skipped over one thing for a reason. So it talks about, on page 1163, electrophysiological monitoring you should change that to neuromonitoring. That's what they're gonna call it. So during some spine cases, they want to monitor all the nerves because we all know the anatomy now. All of, everything that comes off of your spinal cord is gonna be a nerve to the rest of your body. So if we're working on, let's say cervical spine, we could hit the sciatic nerve. So they could end up with pain in the back of their leg, but that sciatic nerve starts up here. So as they're doing the case, if there's neuro monitoring, it's gonna, what, what they're gonna say is, we have a fire or the nerve is firing at, and they'll tell you the level. That's pretty amazing science. So what all of these lines are, are actually needles. So the neuro monitoring people come in while we are positioning the patient. Once they are asleep, they're going to insert a needle with a line into everywhere they wanna track. So one of the places they track is anal sphincter. Another place they track is on the arm, on the head, on the leg, on the shoulder, on the belly. It's just all kinds of different places. We are sticking a needle into the nerve so that when we're doing spine surgery and they accidentally pull on that nerve rootlet, the neuromonitoring people in the corner say, hey, uh, we have a fire on this exact nerve at this exact level. Is that where you're working? And the neurosurgeon usually backs off a little and says, yes, I was. <laughs> Guess I won't touch that part. I'm angering that part of the nerve. Let me go over here. So they're constantly making sure that we're not hurting the patient. Neuromonitoring is essential for a lot of these cases. And your book might mention if they do neuromonitoring, but they don't. 
understand the importance of it. And for you as a scrub tech, what I want you to know is I have seen so many people get stuck with these line needles. So again, all of these lines are connected to a very small needle, straight needle, that is stuck into different parts of the body throughout the body where there are nerves so that they can monitor whether we are injuring these nerves during the case. So that's another thing that you need to help with communication. There was one time specifically, I remember my neuromonitoring people in the corner say, hey, we're firing, hey, we're firing, hey, <laughs> the surgeon was not listening. And I finally just withheld instruments. Not something that I normally do, but I just stopped handing instruments. And I said to my surgeon, did you hear what our neuromonitoring people said? And they didn't. They, they're so focused on what they're doing, they can block out all of that noise. They're used to all that commotion in the background. They completely blocked it out. The surgeon didn't hear what that person was saying at all. So we could have done some real nerve damage, but I was not gonna let that happen. The only thing that was gonna catch that surgeon's attention is if I refused to give him an instrument. So he said, pituitary, pituitary, pituitary. Sir, neuromonitoring is trying to communicate with you. We're trying to protect this patient. That'll get them to stop. <laughs> so it still went directly back to passing very quickly, but patient safety is very important. So that's why we're gonna do neuromonitoring for these cases. So this is not just posterior cervical decompression. This is spine cases, lots of spine cases we're gonna do neuromonitoring. I just chose to talk about it when we got to this case, because you can see in the picture, all of the cords that are gonna be there. So think about this, we moved the patient from the stretcher into this position, all while they were asleep, put them in pens and everything, and then the neuromonitoring person put in all of their lines. That means six hours later when you're done with this procedure, you're taking all this stuff down, you're just gonna rip the drapes off. You're gonna completely forget that we have done neuromonitoring and there's all these little needles and lines everywhere. If you rip that drape off, you're gonna pull some of those needles out and make your patient bleed because they're not supposed to be pulled out like that. But more importantly, you're gonna put everybody you work with at risk now because we have to flip that patient from prone back over to supine on the gurney safely with that tube in their mouth. We should be focusing on that line, right? not all these extra little lines. So they usually tape these into place so they can't get pulled out as easily, but I have definitely seen they pull the drape off and they pull all of these neuromonitoring needles out. And then I have definitely seen, we think they're all protected, we've got all the lines, we go to move the patient over from the OR table to the gurney and somebody gets stuck with a needle in the process. I've seen it many, many times. If you hear the term neuromonitoring, you need to know there's gonna be needles in different places in the body, and you need to look out for that when moving and transporting your patient. So I pointed that out for your safety, so nothing like that happens to you that I saw many, many times, and knock on wood, it did not happen to me. So uh, I'm not gonna go through this procedure because it's posterior cervical decompression, so it's still a cervical decompression, it's just posterior and we've talked about posterior spine now so you should understand that part so again you're paying attention to the fact that we are clamped in pins for this position so that's what's different on this one we are in skull clamps after that i go to anterior thoracic so this one i again just put what's different so i'm not going to go through all the spine stuff again that you already know for a laminectomy that's why most of these things say same for laminectomy the laminectomy. So same instrumentation, same things like that, except you need some extra stuff for this one. So it's kind of like you're doing a thoracotomy and then a spine case. So you'll need the thoracotomy exposure instruments on top of all the other stuff that you have. So that you can understand that you can see the spine that way. I went ahead and included some pictures so you can really see where that vertebral body is and why we have to approach it this way for um, interior thoracic only. That's what's different on that one. Okay, this last slide is because your book only goes through a couple procedures and there's so much more. So I really want you to study this picture for externship. So I did a lot of a lifts and p lifts, but there's all these different versions and you do need to know these terms. Um, 
I definitely had a question about PLIF on my CST and your book does not go into detail about that. So you need to understand what PLIF stands for, posterior lumbar inner body fusion. So now you understand what laminectomies are, you know what the fusion is, you know what inner body in between the vertebral body fusion is. So as you're reading this, make sure you understand what portion of the body we're going to work on. So if you've heard me say the term 360 back, this is when we're doing both anterior and posterior. So if you see that comment or hear that term, that means we're gonna be doing multiple of these procedures or it's an ACDF and one of these posterior procedures. So make sure you're reading this and understanding the acronyms. So when you go out there to externship and they put you on a T lift, you're not completely clueless on what is happening. You're thinking, and I didn't learn anything about a T lift um, and spine surgery. Yes, you did. You have learned everything that's in your book. Everything in your book applies to this. You just need to learn the acronyms. So make sure you study that part. No page number for that one. Ah, that brings me to rhizotomy. Very cool exposure for this case. So rhizotomy. So surgical procedure to sever nerve roots in the spinal cord. So this is for people with chronic back pain that they have not found another solution for. So this is kind of like a last resort. So specifically for, where to go, for spinal joint pain um, and a facet rhizotomy may provide that long lasting low back pain relief that they are wanting. So low back pain is what's typically done for. You can see it also can be done um, with children with cerebral palsy. So many different options, make sure you read through those. I put this note on this procedure so it can really hit home and you can understand why we don't pass instruments over the spinal cord. So that's for all spine surgery. I know I didn't focus on that in the beginning because I saved it for this procedure, but we still never pass instruments over that exposed spinal cord. So think about the big heavy instruments we have. What about a big flex ronger? I go to hand it to the surgeon, their hands out. I put it in their hand. I start retracting my hand. They didn't fully grasp on it. It drops onto the spinal cord. That could paralyze your patient. This isn't something to hesitate on. This is a good time to practice your skills of being decisive, not being hesitant in any way. Uh, John said in the lab one time, I'd rather you slap the wrong instrument into my hand with absolute confidence than give me a lazy pass. Not only is that important for all scrap teching, this is vitally important for neurosurgery. You have to make sure they grab that instrument before you let go. There were many times where I heard my surgeon go, let go, Michelle. I don't care, I'm okay with that extra communication because it's not gonna fall on that spinal cord on my watch. I will not let that happen. So I want you to feel the same way about that and take it seriously. As far as not passing over the spinal cord, that's so hard when your surgeon is across from you. So the way I kind of dealt with this is your instruments are right in front of you on your Mayo stand, right? So you can grab your instrument and kind of go around and then place it in the surgeon's hand. So you're going around that spinal cord and going on the other side of the back where it's safe. So if for some reason it were to drop, it's gonna hit their back, not the open incision that opens spinal cord. So make sure you practice that move when you first get into a spine case of passing around. It's kind of awkward and weird, but that is very necessary because we are human beings, we make mistakes, right? So take out the room for error and don't ever pass over the spinal cord, especially when it's exposed. So very decisive movements, no hesitation, especially in neurosurgery. That was definitely something that I had to learn because I was very hesitant and leery to make moves and this made me more confident, more decisive, and more decisive <laughs> for sure. Okay, so look at the amazing anatomy you're gonna get to see on this case. So again, your book doesn't go over spinal cord tumors, which are so cool, but now you'll see why I like them so much. So if there's a tumor right here by one of these nerves, it is connected by all of that tissue. So that's why I said it looks like almost a spider web webbing out through all of the nerves. Very cool to see. So they can typically do this one with loops, but they could also do it with a microscope. So I want to make sure 
thought you add that in loops or a microscope because it doesn't really mention that in your equipment and supplies but very cool case you're going to be exposing that spinal cord and severing some of those nerves uh, for me i would say you need extra everything extra cotinoids extra hemostatic agents extra everything so this is common for us to sever some of the nerves and then maybe uh, investigate further so they would make a larger incision if they need to. So I always had lots of extra hemostatic agents and cottonoid patties. You can see them using a nerve hook right here. You can see them using some micro scissors right here. That might be a nerve stimulator, I can't tell. And then over here, I hope you can see some of these stitches. So just like in the brain, you have to cut over the dura, right? There's dura covering everything. You cut that open and you have to uh, tack with 4-0 nylon sutures that tissue out of the way. So all of these black strings that you see are those stitches that is retracting the dura. And you can't see it because they have padded with cottonoid patties all the way around it. So everything is padded really nicely. They have really good exposure and you can see. Uh, if you ever get a chance to scrub one of these cases, it's definitely worth it to see exactly this, this really awesome anatomy. Okay, after that, we are out of the spine, unfortunately. So <laughs> we are going to talk about two different nerve cases that a lot of students are tempted to write down as ortho. I want you to know if you're working on the nerve, it's going to be neurosurgery. Now, when you get to externship, you're going to learn all the stipulations on how to chart not chart, how to document your case. So you get credit during under the right specialty. So you guys have been starting to work on case reports. So I hope you're seeing little details like that. Like this would go under neurosurgery, not orthopedic surgery. So uh, watch a carpal tunnel release open versus an endoscopic because we do both now and both can be done very quickly. So this is the case that I told you when I was a student that I met the surgeon I was setting up very, I'm sure slowly because I was a student and, you know, really meticulously looking at things. And I noticed that the surgeon was kind of chuckling at me and I, you know, what, am I missing something, sir? No, I just want to let you know, I'm going to have this case done before you get the light handles on. I said, okay, that's kind of odd. So I'm a new person, right? I'm throwing the bovi, laying everything out. I pull my back table up. I attach the light handle covers, so I did get them on before he finished, and when I look over, he had already grabbed the knife out of the, off of the back table, gotten down to it, and then he was reaching for the scissors. I was shocked because I thought I was fast, so I grabbed the scissors before he gets to it and hands it to him so I could at least hand him that instrument. He cuts the nerve, and he says, see, I told you I'm done. <laughs> Of course, I pointed up at the light handle covers. Hey, I got them on. But his point was, this is gonna be so fast, we don't even need light handle covers. So some surgeons do this so quickly that they're in and they're out. They get in, they cut it, they go. So know what they are doing in this case. Know what the carpal tunnel syndrome is. Uh, know what's being compressed. So the medium nerve is what's being compressed and what we're cutting is that transverse carpal ligament. So Watch the two videos and see that it can be done slowly open. It can be done really fast endoscopically. And then what's not pictured is really fast open. So very small incision, like I said, less than five minutes sometimes. But every surgeon is different. I've heard of surgeons that take an hour on a carpal tunnel because they're very meticulous. So everybody's a little different. Make sure you know the anatomy and that is a neuro case. Uh, I want to add one thing actually. So, instrument equipments and supplies. Not everybody uses an S mark bandage, which you will see in this video. It's because there's just not a lot of bleeding that happens on these cases. So, everybody's different, but know that exsanguination with an S mark bandage, which you know what that is, is uh, used sometimes on these procedures. And then a hand table. A hand table is what you need to attach to the bed so the arm can be out for the carpal tunnel. Okay. Now we can look at ulnar nerve transposition. So I put a picture of the anatomy on there for you so you can understand what's happening on this case, but let's go ahead and read. 
ulnar nerve travels through the tunnel of the tissue, that cubital tunnel this time, and it runs under the medial epicondyle of the elbow. So that's why this is referred to as the funny bone. It's not so funny when you hit it because it hurts pretty bad, but this is similar to a carpal tunnel, right? And we're working on the nerve. So you can see all the anatomy on here for you that you're gonna to get to see in this case. So I want you to watch the case ulnar nerve transposition so you can see what all they're gonna be doing. Mm -hmm. One more thing, look at your practical considerations. Ulnar nerve pain can be relieved with surgical intervention from two different surgical procedures, ulnar nerve decompression, and ulnar nerve transposition. So remember transposition is just relocation of that ulnar nerve. So that's what we are going to always try to do if we can instead of severing a nerve, right? We want to just move it into the correct position so that nerve can get in the wrong spot and you have to come in and get the ulnar nerve transposition so it gets back into the correct spot. So painful for the patients and that's why we want to do the surgery as soon as possible Definitely not emergent or anything like that. So you might be on a waiting list, but the patients are gonna to wanna to get it done as soon as possible. Uh, for the surgical procedure, I just wanna add, it's kind of like vascular because you're on the arm, but it's neuro. So you're gonna be using things like vessel loops and some other vascular um, things. So umbilical tape, that's moist. Vessel loops or Penrose tubing can be used to pass around these nerves and ligaments. Okay, so that's your last neuro case. So I know these last two uh, don't feel like they're neuro cases because you've got carpal tunnel, that's a hand or wrist case, and then a ulnar nerve transposition that is a upper extremity case, is an arm case. So very different. So I want you to keep that in mind as you go to externship. Anytime you're working on a nerve, that's another procedure. It could be a neuro procedure. Neuro procedures are harder to get as externs. Since I was a site coordinator um, at St. Francis South, I can tell you they do spine cases there, but not as often as they do general and robotics and GYN. So you might get that stuff filled up really quickly. So because of that, if you have an opportunity to get on a neuro case, you should jump on that opportunity and get that experience before you get out there as a scrub tech. But I have so much more information about spine. So if you are curious and you have some questions, Feel free to ask me uh, some questions or comments below after I post this. And if you want some more information, I can give you some websites to look at like Stryker and Depew so you can look at some of the options. But that's all I have for neurosurgery. I hope to see you guys really soon. Have a good one. Bye.